Hello everyone, my name is Alexandra Sanchez and you are watching Get It Together. Today I have with me Professor Derek Adams. He is an English professor here at Ithaca College. Thank you very much for speaking with me today. Glad to be here. <laughs> um, today we are going to be discussing the Integrative Core Curriculum Diversity Requirement here at Ithaca College. Here we call it the ICC. Um, before I go into the requirement itself, I want to acknowledge the different aspects of diversity. Um, it can include ethnicity, race, uh, gender, sexual orientation, um, socioeconomic socio status, physical abilities, and religious beliefs, etc. Uh, but today we're going to be focusing on the different dimensions of race and ethnicity. So Ithaca College has pretty much known to be a liberal college. Um, I've been here for I've already had two semesters under my belt, um, and I've noticed the different strides that uh, we've made as far as in the LGBTQ plus community, mm -hmm. um, but I haven't seen the same passion for addressing issues that uh, students of color on campus mm -hmm. are facing. Mm -hmm. um, and so shifting to the ICC diversity requirement, mm -hmm. the current requirement only requires one course mm -hmm. to be taken throughout the four years that a student is here on campus. Mm -hmm. Do you see anything wrong with this requirement? Yeah, I see actually quite a bit wrong with that requirement. Uh, for one thing, it's only one course requirement out of uh, a lot of courses that you can potentially take here at, I at IC. If you think about taking 120 credits overall as a graduation requirement, and there are slight variations on that, but for the most part, most students take 120 credits, which means you take roughly 43 credit courses in your time here. If only one of those classes has to address diversity, then I don't even know what the percentage is. Two and a half percent of your experience here is dedicated to some issue of diversity that um, uh, that you want you actively want to explore by virtue of the class that you've chosen. That's not a lot, right? Mm -hmm. um, not at all. And in fact, it seems really inadequate when we think about how large the issues are that we're facing relative to race and ethnicity, um, specifically with race. And w when we hear the word diversity here at Ithaca College, I think we almost always are thinking about it through a racialized lens, right? right? We rarely ever are thinking about it in terms of gender and gender expression or LGBTQ plus identities. Um, it's almost always about race. And yet we seem to be reluctant to explore that in much greater detail. Some students do. Um, Absolutely. But by virtue of requiring only one course to address that, you could basically consider it just a box that you have to check and you can move along, right? Um, it needs to be a much greater part of the entire curriculum here if indeed we want to make any of the strides that we were attempting to make during the 2015 demonstrations here on campus, mm -hmm. which were organized largely around uh, concepts of race and racial inequality. Uh, or relative to the experiences that are happening now in our culture, like the Charlottesville incident, right? And being able to actually have a dialogue about what was transpiring, transpiring with white nationalism, for example. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's grossly inadequate and doesn't do our students um, justice when thinking about what it is they will need to be equipped with when they leave IC. Um, and even in the diversity courses um, that I've taken, teachers are very, um, they, they like to focus on these safe spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you just said about exploring the different dimensions of race, um, how do you think students, like how do you feel about safe spaces? Because mm -hmm. I know that from my experience, as far as being in a, a class where I'm, I'm uncomfortable, that's mm -hmm. where I've learned the most. Mm -hmm. um, and so in order to really dig deep into the topics of diversity or the lack thereof, mm -hmm. um, I think people are gonna have to face um, issues that they've never had to deal with before. So how do you feel about safe spaces? Yeah, safe spaces are interesting. I've been using the language of safe space for a number of years when I did my um, minor in women and gender studies, my PhD minor. And I've really, I really um, believe in the concept of a safe space, but I think I see it differently than a lot of people do. And we can even talk about uh, President Collado's introduction of brave space as a mm -hmm. terminology. Uh, but for me, a safe space is not necessarily creating conditions where students um, talk about things so comfortably that there's never any tension, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's been a misinterpretation of what a safe space is supposed to do. So some conservative students, politically conservative students, might think, well, a safe space means I should be able to share with you this particular view that I have, and nobody can challenge that. Or a liberal student might say, I can share with you this particular point of view, and nobody can challenge that. And for me, a safe space is actually sharing those views and then having them challenged without necessarily tearing apart the person who's offering them. We can deconstruct them as ideas. We can talk about about the way we feel in relationship to those things, but we aren't tearing apart a person because of the way she or he thinks. 
uh, we are simply addressing the way that they've presented something to us and also what they have presented to us. So I think a safe space can be productive. And as you suggested, right, you can learn much more in those kinds of situations than you can if people are just simply sharing ideas that make us feel good and then we sort of move along, right? We have a very polite conversation without actually getting anywhere. Right. Um, talking about things that make people somewhat uncomfortable. Um, you mentioned in a previous conversation with me that you were in a meeting and you made a comment that maybe some people may not have been so comfortable with. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you suggested that students of color should stop being recruited um, mm -hmm. at Ithaca College because it's not necessarily benefiting them. Mm -hmm. um, so what was your reasoning behind saying this and who mm -hmm. is it actually benefiting? Mm -hmm. I think the I'll address the latter part first. Who do I think it's benefiting when we recruit students of color here? I think it's benefiting largely people who, a, a white student population for the most part, mm -hmm. who um, have had very few opportunities to talk about these kinds of things and can feel good about themselves because there are black students in there to educate them about, or brown students or whatever, who can educate them about the things that they don't know, mm -hmm. right? But therein lies the problem, which is that students should not be required to pay $60,000 a year to come to an institution like this to teach other people things that they should be able to learn from people like me. Right? Right. Exactly. Uh, people who are faculty who get paid to do that kind of instruction. So that that is also starting to answer the first question, which is what is the motivation behind this? Um, I think I see a real problem with asking students, uh, not, not asking, but actively recruiting a group of students to come here with the idea in mind that they might be able to teach us something about their experiences that we don't already know. We should be able to go and find this out for ourselves, right? We should be able, as faculty especially, we should be able to do that hard work and then teach our students things that they need to know. But if students of color are only being brought in to give us a sort of visual diversity and then teach us sort of life lessons, I don't know how that's any different than like really bad movies about you know, like black magicians who come in at the end to save us all. It doesn't seem to make any sense whatsoever. Um, and, and we have actually a lot of evidence. The, the meeting in which I had presented this idea about, ac uh, about stopping actively recruiting students of color, uh, in that meeting, a lot of quantitative data was presented to us that showed us that students of color, self-identified Alana students who come to this campus, who are on, um, uh, who, who have a like combination of need-based and merit-based scholarship, but largely need-based, they tend to be the only group who doesn't perform as well academically as they did before they got here. All mm -hmm. other groups do. Even self-identified Alana students who are here only on merit-based scholarship still do better uh, than they had otherwise. But a lot of the students that we recruit to represent the kind of visual diversity that we want are students who have a combination of need-based and merit-based scholarship, and they are the ones who actually aren't doing as well academically, right? There's a drop-off in their performance. So it doesn't seem to make any sense to bring them in here if the academic performance just drops off. And we have a lot of convenient excuses for that. We say, well, they weren't prepared for college, or um, they had terrible teachers beforehand, or whatever the case might be. And maybe there's some truth to that. I think there are things we could do to better prepare students when they come to college. But how is it that only that one group is struggling in a way that none of the other groups are. Right? It, just, it just doesn't make any sense at all. So I think we need to actively work to retain the students of color who are already here. Mm -hmm. And we can do that by alleviating some of the stresses um, that are associated with, um, with like student loan debt and, and um, making sure that faculty themselves are actually equipped to teach them the things that they need to know while they're here. Uh, but that, that has to be our first goal. And if we can do that well, I think we won't have to actively recruit students of color. I think they'll want to come to a space where they know students of color are retained anyway. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you and Dr. Sarah Grumberg have created an intergroup discussions course that can address the topic that we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. Can you explain how these discussions uh, can affect how students learn and change the way that we ask questions about diversity. Yeah, so in in this class, this is a, I mean, I have to credit Professor Grunberg for this because it was really her brainchild. Uh, <laughs> the intergroup dialogue course that we did on race and ethnicity, we piloted a, a section in the spring semester, spring 2017. Mm -hmm. And the idea behind the course is to give it some sort of parameters for talking about issues of, of difference in social identity location. So ours happen to be about race and ethnicity, but you could do it on gender and gender expression, mm -hmm. uh, sexuality, whatever else. Uh, but the real focus of the course is on dialogue itself. So how do you engage in a productive dialogue? How is dialogue different from discussion and debate? And in fact, in asking that question, we're already kind of addressing the point, which is how do you create a safe space for dialogue, right? And we, 
thought that if we made dialogue the centerpiece of the class and we were constantly checking in with students to ask whether or not we are engaging in a dialogue or are we simply debating people to try to tear, tear them apart or we're listening only to disprove what it is that they say, um, then we might not be doing the work that we want to do, right? There's a particular amount of empathy that has to go into dialogue, right? I would be listening to your story. I would try to connect to the feelings that you're expressing in the sharing of that story. Um, and nobody can ever occupy somebody else's subject position. That's impossible. But if we're attempting to, and if we're operating in good faith, then it becomes easier to discuss the really controversial issues surrounding things like race and ethnicity that we otherwise um, ignore or neglect or, or sometimes just flat out avoid. Right? Mm -hmm. um, out of this course, mm -hmm. um, students wrote uh, propositions for how we can change the ICC diversity requirement. Mm -hmm. um, and so there were three. So students should be required to take four classes at each level. Each mm -hmm. course should offer an intersectional approach. Mm -hmm. And one course needs to be directly relevant to their major, mm -hmm. which I completely identify with. Mm -hmm. um, because in the Park School of Communications, there are a lot of students who want to report on and make documentaries about people and communities they know almost nothing about. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, <laughs> um, it's a little bit frustrating mm -hmm. um, as a student of color mm -hmm. seeing this go on. Mm -hmm. um, and so hopefully something like this conversation mm -hmm. um, can lead to other conversations with our provost, um, mm -hmm. Linda Petrosino, mm -hmm. and hopefully actually implement real change. Yeah. Um, but how do you, how do, how do we get professors talking about, like, how do we get them to start talking about diversity within their own courses? Mm -hmm. That's a, a particularly tough challenge. Right. And I think e even if we, if, if we set this up as a kind of requirement, for example, like all professors will do X or Y, we do run into some issues of academic freedom, right, that right. I think professors are going to push back against. Why am I being forced to talk about this? This is not part of my discipline. My expertise is in X or Y. And I, I don't know that I have a great answer for any of that, except to say that because issues of inclusivity and diversity are something that involve all of us, we should probably all be invested in doing something about it. Mm -hmm. But relative to what the students proposed and how we might address that, I mean, I think, it, I think what the students proposed, and there were two groups that did this. It was an intergroup collaborative project that they put together. And they wrote articles in the Ithaca and explaining how they would change the diversity requirement for the ICC. And th some of those were fantastic ideas. And I was really impressed with, with what the students came up with. But even with all of the thought that they had put into it, there's still some shortcomings, which are part of what we're describing right here, which is, OK, so you assign um, four courses as the requirement instead of one course. Well, who's teaching these courses, right? right. Do they have expertise in, in, in diversity? Do they have expertise in diversity within their discipline, right? Um, what does diversity look like if you are um, an, an Asian woman who teaches molecular biology? And how is that different than being uh, a biracial male who teaches uh, 20th century literature, right? There are all sorts of complications that go into that, mm -hmm. questions about training. And I don't know, again, I don't know that I have a good answer for that either. We are offering opportunities for intergroup dialogue training, but that wouldn't resolve all of the issues that we are facing with uh, or that we're encountering. So, so yeah, there are good things that are coming about as a result of the things that these students are recommending, but there are these other I don't know, harder questions to answer about. Like, wh what, does any, uh, you know, what does any of this mean for people who don't identify as part of the group that they would want to uh, teach in their classes? So what does it mean for me to teach a course called Black Women Writers when I'm not a woman, right? Mm -hmm. And isn't my male privilege at work if I'm determining how the course is going to be structured, what we're going to read, what sorts of questions we're going to ask, how we're going to talk about this? Uh, the same would be true if you are, I don't know, a white male professor who wants to write about, I don't know, e East Asian um, uh, women's philosophy or religion or something like that, right? So, so there are all kinds of complications that go into this, but I, th uh, I think what we need to be aware of is whether or not we are operating in good faith when we do make attempts to do that. And some people are so scared to engage in those kinds of dialogues or conversations that they just say, I want to wash my hands of it. We'll let people of color who are already faculty here do uh, carry that workload. And, and I don't know that that's going to be particularly productive either, because then it just assumes that only people of color or only women can teach about those kinds of issues. And we know that that's not true. Right. So where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? It's a good question. I think the place that we have to go from here, um, in, in one part is going to involve leadership from our new president. right? And the direction that I think 
she is taking this institution relative to um, the language of, of inclusivity just sort of generally, right? Um, maybe shifting away from talking about diversity to talking about inclusivity might be mm -hmm. helpful because that has a more positive spin on it, right? So inclusivity is drawing people in, inviting them in, as opposed to diversity, which is a, a buzzword that a lot of people resist. So that's one thing. I think we can change the way that we s just sort of talk about um, uh, issues of social identity collectively. I think the other thing is we have to give serious consideration to how we're going to resource uh, new sorts of courses that are being offered. Right? So if indeed we're going to offer more intergroup dialogue courses because th you have an opportunity in there to do the kinds of hard work that we have been discussing, well, we have to figure out how we're going to pay for that, um, how people are going to be trained to do it, what mm -hmm. sorts of mechanism for assessment that we have. Uh, but I do think that that is a possibility. And I think especially with the new president uh, who encourages innovation, that also includes teaching innovation so we can think about it in that way. I also think we just have to start doing a better job of resourcing um, our students when they're here, specific things that they might be interested in pursuing, right? Uh, or supporting them when they are engaging in demonstrations on the campus, or listening to them when they have ideas to share, um, and not always relying on people of color to tell us all of the things that we need to know about racial diversity, and not always relying on women to tell us the things we need to know about, say, gender um, uh, diversity, or members of LGBTQ communities uh, for other kinds of diversity, right? We can't always rely on those people to be doing the work. We have to do a sort of collective buy-in, uh, which is to say that, again, if this involves all of us, then we're all going to be equally invested in it. Hmm. Well, thank you very much for speaking with me. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I appreciate it. That concludes our conversation. But At least for the time being. For the time <laughs> being. <laughs> thank you for joining us. This is Get It Together, and I'm your host, Alexandra Sanchez.